Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to the International Health Policy Fellowship Launch Ceremony and Public Lecture. Organized by the Chinese University of Hong Kong and the National Academy of Medicine. I'm Joey Chan, a year three medical student from the Faculty of Medicine, CUHK. And I'll be your MC for this morning ceremony. On behalf of the organizers, we would like to extend our warmest welcome to all of you here and to those who are watching from our, on the live broadcast to our first ever joint event of CUHK and NAM. We appreciate that you're taking time off your busy schedules to join us today. Today's event is in recognition of the establishment of the International Health Policy Fellowship, a prestigious three-year program to be based at both CUHK and NAM has, NAM's headquarters in Washington, DC. This is NEM's first international fellowship program, as well as its first collaboration with CUHK. After the ceremony, Dr. Victor Zhou, president of the National Academy of Medicine, will share his insights into the work of NAM, as well as its efforts to shape the future of health and medicine with collaboration of its global partners. First of all, let's introduce our distinguished official guests. Professor Joseph Song, Vice Chancellor and President, the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Dr. Victor Zhou, President, the National Academy of Medicine. Dr. Edgar Zhang, Chairman, the Lanson Foundation. Professor Fok Tai Fai, Pro Vice Chancellor and Vice President, the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Professor Francis Chan, Dean, Faculty of Medicine, the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Dr. Derek Ao, Director, Center for Bioethics, the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Now, I'd like to invite Professor Francis Chan, Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, CUHK, to deliver a welcome speech. Professor Chan, please. Dr. Victor Chow, President of the National Academy of Medicine, President Professor Joseph Song, Dr. Edgar Chang, Pro Vice Chancellor Professor Falk, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My warmest welcome to all of you to the launch ceremony of the very first collaboration of the CHK and the National Academy of Medicine for the International Health Policy Fellowship. For some of our students who may not be all that familiar with the National Academy of Medicine, I can tell you the NAM is a well-renowned and perhaps the most influential health policy advisory group to the US government. And every now and then, there are numerous institutions and organizations uh, that are striving to establish partnership with the NAM. And I'm very proud and pleased to tell you that CHK is amongst the first academic partner to launch the very first fellowship in health policy uh, with the NAM for our CHK fellows. This health policy fellowship is designed to support our fellows to study international health policy and to facilitate them to develop informed solutions to some of the world's most critical health policy issues. Health policy defines a vision for the future and often requires complex procedures, including elaborate planning, extensive communication and negotiation, and collective effort to achieve healthcare goals within the society. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the National Academy of Medicine for making the fellowship available for our fellows to earn unique training opportunity that is otherwise not quite possible, especially for those who start their 
career at the entry level. And I believe this fellowship will foster positive and constructive cross-regional exchanges that will help bridge the gap between the worlds of ethics and health policy making, covering a range of disciplines from medicine to philosophy, law, and social sciences. And I believe our fellows will gain significant work experience and will undoubtedly help their future career. And I have to say that the establishment of the fellowship was not easy. In particular, I would like to thank my, I would like to express my heartfelt thanks to the major donor for his trust and foresight in launching the fellowship with the NAM. Uh, I was instructed not to disclose the donor's name, <laughs> but it is really my heartfelt gratitude to his enormous support to the Chinese University of Hong Kong. The support from him has brought together CHK and them for the partnership and will facilitate our young healthcare professionals to learn from them for developing profound knowledge and extensive experience in coping with healthcare policy and critical issues facing the world. So I look forward to your continuing support to the fellowship. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Professor Chan. Now, we're pleased to invite Professor Joseph Song, Vice Chancellor and Principal of CUHK, to come on stage to deliver a welcome message. Professor Song, please. Good morning, uh, Dr. Victor Chow, Dr. Eka Zheng, distinguished guests, both in Hong Kong as well as in Washington, D.C. Hi, good evening for you guys uh, on the other side. It's a great pleasure and privilege for me to take this opportunity to warmly welcome all guests here with us and those who are on the live broadcast watching this event as we launch. The U.S. National Academy of Medicine's International Health Policy Fellowship. This new fellowship joins the Academy's four national fellowship programs and represents the first time it has designed a program specifically to develop a pipeline to health policy professionals for international community. The Chinese University CUHK is proud to be the, the, first, the Academy's first partner in this initiative. I would in particular like to thank Dr. Victor Chow, President of the U.S. National Academy of Medicine, for being with us today. Let's give him another big round of applause. Today he will share with us his thoughts on how the National Academy of Medicine is shaping the future of health and medicine. Today's health issue crosses border. Keys to solve health issues facing mankind will be global partnership among academic institutions, the private sector, governments, and non-government organizations such as NAM. The collaboration between CUHK and NAM aims to nurture future talents to address complicated health issues domestically as well as internationally. Health policy goes beyond individuals to population, both local and global, and has long-lasting impact at many different levels. You see, I was raised as a clinician and I devoted almost all my career in clinical medicine. Not until the year 2003, when SARS hit Hong Kong, I start to realize how important it is not just to be a good clinician by ourselves, but also we should have a good healthcare policy and come joining the hospital system and the community system, as well as to be trained in bioethics because we are dealing with life and death situation every day. And there are many decisions which are beyond Harrison's textbook of medicine can teach us. <laughs> so the National Academy of Medicine is, leading, is the leading independent evidence-based advisory body to the US government on policy that relates to health sciences and medicine. And ethics is one of the most important topic 
on which the U.S. government has sought advice and will be an important focus of the new international fellowship program. This is why our relationship is so important, not just for CUHK, but for Hong Kong. And I hope you will also for the whole region because we are going to train people outside of Hong Kong as well. It may only be three fellows at first, but these are seeds that will grow, I'm sure. And we must, at this point once again, give our heartfelt thanks to the generous donation of the Hong Kong philanthropist. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we give him a round of applause? Well? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have not disclosed anything. but <laughs> <laughs> So he is going to send, at the, at the start, three fellows from Hong Kong to join the program. CUHK is NAM's initial partner of this International Health Policy Fellowship, and it will be an extraordinary experience for our colleagues to spend several months uh, to study and sh uh, share our experience in Washington, D.C. at NAM's headquarters, where they will be assigning NAM's mentors to work on specific initiatives, co-texturizing and deepening NAM's themes based on the Hong Kong experience. CUHK will give full support to the selected fellow for their training leaves and studied in the United States. So when I step down from the vice chancellorship, I should be entitled to join this fellowship <laughs> as well, I suppose. <clears throat> in addition, I would like to thank once again Dr. Victor Shao for his vision and commitment to partnering with CUHK in this endeavor to establish Academy's first global fellowship Dr. Shao was born in Shanghai, so we can speak some Shanghainese later, <laughs> and reared in Hong Kong. He attended the St. Joseph's College, leaving at the age of 18 to pursue uh, university and medical studies in Canada, McGill University, I was told. And Dr. Shao uh, leads, to, leads an institution with over 2,000 fellows, including 50 Nobel laureates, and it's one of the world's most influential figure in health and medicine in the whole world. We are very privileged to have you, Victor, here and uh, to share with us your wisdom and your vision on the future of health and medicine. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, I wish to thank you all for joining us today. On the other side of the globe, I hope you will stay awake until the end of the symposium. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Song. Now, can we please join hands to welcome Dr. Victor Zhou, President of the National Academy of Medicine, please. <laughs> Dr. Zhou, please. Good morning, and it's a great day. It's a great day of launching this international fellowship. Vice Chancellor, President uh, Joseph Song, Dr. Edgar Chan, my good friend, Pro Vice Chancellor and Vice President Fok Tai Fai, Dean Francis Chan, and Dr. Derek Ao. So thank you so much. I'm truly honored to be here today. You know, I, I'm always happy to be here in Hong Kong because, of, because in many ways it's home for me. And it's great to be launching the National Academy of Medicine new international health policy fellowships here together in partnership with Chinese University of Hong Kong. As the second oldest university in Hong Kong, CUHK is definitely one of Hong Kong's treasures. It's a major hub for innovation, new ideas, fresh approaches to complex problems. And of course, we at the US National Academy of Medicine, we feel very privileged to be partnering with you for this new uh, fellowship, and particularly with a new center for Bioethics Center uh, to launch this partnership today. So this center has truly been a visionary because it focuses on real-world eth ethical challenges in health and healthcare, particularly in biomedicine and biotechnology. As you know, the medical world is just on the verge of some major breakthroughs due to rapidly advancing science technology. But these promising developments may raise and also frequently raise new issues regarding 
ethical, legal, and social societal issues that can be solved by science alone. With the help of these fellowships, the center is sure to provide the expertise and guidance needed to help navigate this complex landscape. I know that many organized people and organizations help make the center reality, but I also know that my good friend Edgar Chan played a very important role. He was a driving force behind uh, its creation. Edgar and I go back a long way. Back in 1972, when I was an intern and he was a resident, he was my boss <laughs> at, uh, at Wild Cornell Medical Center in New York Hospital. So, of course, Edgar and I have formed a great friendship, but I remember him as a bright, young, caring physician who gave me a hard time when I didn't do a good job. <laughs> but he had good judgment and vision. And importantly, he was a good friend who was always there for me. You, you know how stressful internship can be. And there, Edgar was always giving me the great support, and I'll never forget it. Edgar has gone on to do so many great things in medicine, business, public finance, including his work on behalf of the center. And certainly, I have great respect and admiration for you, Edgar. Now, the National Academy of Medicine is the leading independent advisory group on health policy in the United States and globally. We've been at the forefront of addressing many of the challenges. We've been home for hundreds of fellowship programs of scholars in the United States. For example, our fellowship programs are really un unparalleled. Over the years, our health policy fellowship program has trained pipeline of health policy scholars who have put forth informed solutions to some of the world's most critical health challenges. So it's obvious that the international fellowship is a natural and timely extension of our work. Threats to health humanity, as you heard from President Song, are increasingly universal, and they are no longer easily contained by national borders. Certainly, the health problems we face in the United States are also being felt in other industrialized countries. Our aging population, for example, is global. And our national health system prepared for the silver tsunami. I guess I'm one of them. Uh, that's coming our way. Can we improve health care for chronic conditions such as diabetes, uh, heart disease, that are increasingly on the rise in so many different countries? And how can we contain the next epi pandemic? So when a country experienced outbreak of highly contagious disease such as Ebola, SARS, or new threat like Zika, every nation must take notice and prepare. So indeed, the National Academy of Medicine has long history at the forefront of addressing these challenges, both the United States and internationally. Now, the impetus for creating this international fellowship came from conversations with my friend Edgar Chan. His vision and generous support enabled us to launch this partnership with CUHK, and, and it's the Bioethics Center. This program will train the next generation of health leaders to develop and champion sound, evidence-based policies that will foster better health in their home countries, of course, especially here in Hong Kong. But equally as important, these fellows will also shape a global network of experts and expertise that will undoubtedly strengthen uh, international responses to health threats they will affect all of us. So our new fellowship program will usher in a new generation of international healthcare leaders, leaders who develop innovative evidence-based health policy that work within their home country's unique cultures, systems, legal, and ethical frameworks. As you heard, a special emphasis on this fellowship is about ethics. It encompasses a range of uh, disciplines from medicine to philosophy to law to social sciences. And in many ways, these fellowships will emphasize these areas in ways that will advance the work of CHK Center for Bioethics. And of course, these fellowships or these fellows will help the center create its own strong core and pipeline of dedicated bioethicists for the future. It's not a one-way street. We have much to learn from you. And the NAM and US have much to gain from these collaborations. Our past experience with international partnerships demonstrated just how enriching they are 
in terms of knowledge, insights, and perspectives, deep bonds and connections, and perhaps most importantly, a stronger understanding of the common problems we face in health and healthcare globally. Many people say they, they want to many people say they want to make the world a better place. And what does that mean exactly? I only know this. Together right now, we have the opportunity to make the world a healthier place together. And I th can think of no other goal more worthwhile than to do it with you, CUHJ, and the creation of this uh, really important international fellowship. So I'm so grateful that you've joined me in this pursuit. And I want to thank you for your hospitality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Zhou. The Chinese University of Hong Kong is proud to serve as NAM's first partner for the International Health Policy Fellowship. This collaboration represents a significant moment for both CUHK and NAM. Now, we will formally launch the International Health Policy Fellowship. May we invite Professor Joseph Song and Dr. Victor Zhou to come on stage for the ceremony, please. Professor Song, representing CUHK, will shake hands with Dr. Zhou, representing <laughs> NAM. witness today the launch of the International Health Policy Fellowship. Thank you, Professor Song and Dr. Zhou. Please remain on stage. <laughs> now may I invite Professor Song to present a token of appreciation to Dr. Zhou for his strong support of the new International Health Policy Fellowship. Our small gift is a pair of chopsticks engraved with Professor Song's calligraphy. In Chinese cuisine, chopsticks are always used in pairs forming a symbol of partnership. <laughs> the ceremony would not have been possible without the support from a number of people. May I invite the following official guests to come on stage for a group photo, please. Dr. Edgar Zhang. <laughs> Professor Fok Tai Fai. <laughs> Professor Francis Chan. <laughs> Dr. Derek Ao. Please let the camera and smile. <laughs> Thank you very much. Please be seated. Now, we will take a group photo with the audience. Our photographer will come onto the stage and take a photo from here. Before the 
lecture begins, let's watch a short video on a brief introduction of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Please enjoy. In this, the 21st century, if we think of the great challenges that lay before us as a society, things like food, energy, climate, health, we need to bring the greatest innovations that the human mind is capable of in the service of civilization. And so the role of informed scientific policy is greater than ever before. Given these challenges, it's important that the nation have some place it can turn to for authoritative, unbiased, scientific advice from experts who only speak the truth based on uncompromising evidence. The mission of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine is to do that for the nation. The National Academy was founded during the darkest days of the Civil War. President Abraham Lincoln and Congress needed scientists and engineers on their side to both win the war and to secure the future economic prosperity and health of the young nation. These are the most celebrated scientists within every scientific field who are tasked with only one thing, to advise the executive branch and, the, and Congress of all ways the progress of science can impact policy and law for the betterment of the country. That's a gift to these United States of America. Over the history of the academies, we're responsible for hundreds of reports every year that have touched so many parts of our lives from the establishment of the National Park Service to repairs to the Hubble telescope, or the fact that so many childhood diseases have been all but eradicated. The output of the National Academies is staggering. Now, we are pleased to have Dr. Derek Ao, Director for the Center of Bioethics, Faculty of Medicine, the Chinese University of Hong Kong, to give an introduction of today's speaker for us. Dr. Ao, please. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's truly an honor to be introducing Dr. Victor Joseph Sao, uh, President of the National Academy of Medicine on this special occasion. Um, Professor Joseph Song already gave away his ties to Shanghai is born in Shanghai and born in Hong Kong, so I skipped that part. <laughs> and in an exceptional renowned career, his academic appointments included the Percy Professor of the Theory and Practice of Physics at Harvard Medical School, physics being a classical term for medicine. And then he was Arthur Bloomfield Professor and Chair of Medicine at Stanford University. He served as President and CEO of Duke University Medical Center prior to his present position. Dr. Sao is first and foremost a medical scientist and leader in healthcare improvement in the US and globally. As a medical scientist, his research laid the foundation for development of angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors for treatment of hypertension and congestive heart failure. Some of, us, some of us here in the audience were actually among the first generation of physicians to use it in our clinical practice to benefit our patients. Dr. Zhao then went on to pioneer gene therapy for vascular disease and was the first to introduce DNA decoy molecules to block transcription 
as gene therapy in humans. As a research leader, his sharp foresight was always, in translational research, is always a great asset to the academies. Dr. Zhao is always very much at the forefront of global healthcare improvement, serving as board directors in health institutions and advisors to governments in the US, Canada, and Singapore. In 2011, he led a partnership among Duke Medicine, the World Economic Forum, and the McKinsey Company to establish the International Partnership for Innovative Healthcare Delivery. Dr. Zhao has received a long list of distinguished awards, prizes, and medals from prestigious institutions across continents. In the interest of time, I'll simply refer you to the program brochure. So without further ado, we are now pass the stage to Dr. Zhao to speak on how the National Academy of Medicine endeavors to shape healthcare in the, in the United States and the world. Dr. Zhao, please. Thank you. Slides on. Great. Well, good, good morning. I guess it's good evening back in uh, Washington. And uh, for me, it's really a historic day for us, the day in which we launched this international partnership with CUHK. You know, I, as many of you know, grew up in Hong Kong, so this is my home. Hong Kong Zeit. And if you talk to me long enough, I can actually try in Cantonese. Uh, that being said, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do. And of course, why this uh, partnership is so important to us. So I, I've taken the, uh, the liberty of calling the title of this talk, Shaping the Future of Health and Medicine. So you already heard from the video clip that the foundational academy of the National Academies of Medicine, Engineering, and Sciences is the National Academy of Sciences. In 1863, it was founded by Abraham Lincoln and Congress and chartered by the government as an independent, non-government institution because they wanted advice from experts at the time of Civil War and onwards. Over the years, a second academy grew out of, which is National, National Academy of Engineering, and then in 1970, the Institute of Medicine, or IOM, as we know it, with a third academy, which changed its name and the constitution on July 1st, 2015, a year after I arrived at this job as a National Academy of Medicine. So today, we have three academies, interdependent, independent, working under one roof, and the three presidents work closely together to advance issues of policy in science, health, and engineering. It's really important for us to reorganize because we recognize that sciences cross borders. And we think about what we do today in health. How often do we have to think about economics, social sciences, engineering, policy? So by this reorganization, as you can see in this slide in the bottom, we have actually divisions that work on different themes and disciplines, but cross disciplinary. So it's, we're very fortunate indeed to have this unique model in the United States of three national academies working closely in conjunction with each other. Our mission is to improve health for all, and I mean all, by advancing knowledge and accelerating progress in science, in medicine policy, and importantly, in equity. And we are, as I said, evidence-based advisor, a national academy with a global scope, committed to catalyzing and achieving impact, collaborating, working across discipline, and of course, our core principle is scientific rigor, objectivity, independence, diversity, inclusion, and equity. We are a society of honorific, distinguished individuals. Every year, we elect 70 members, and of course, you can imagine, it's highly, highly competitive and desirable. Oops. We have, at this point, more than 2,000 members over this last almost 50 years, cumulative. And of course, by bylaws, 
We want about a quarter of our members to come outside the health professions so that they can cross-fertilize. They may be working in health area, but they could be economists, engineers, etc. We have among our membership 50 Nobel laureates, 58 presidential medical, uh, medal of science, and of course, 20 medical, uh, medals of technology innovation, and many, many other awardees. But that's not all we do. It's not just an honorific society. We, make the, we put them to work. And it's not only that we work with our members who are experts in the area, but we bring in other people. And every year we have two, 3,000 volunteers, members and non-members, working with us on many important critical issues, in this case, in health, sciences, and medicine. So what do we do? Well, we are the policy organization, so we convene the very best minds, and together we look at what are the global issues, US issues that we need to work on to provide guidance about future directions. So we produce, therefore, high quality reports, which are recommendations, formal recommendations, for example, as you heard, to Congress, to US administration, and of course, to the public and to globally. So over the years, I want to show you some examples of work we've done which have achieved great impact. For example, you can see on the far left side this very seminal work called The Air is Human. And in fact, it is the report that started the movement of patient safety. It was that first report back over 18 years ago when we pointed out that 98,000 or more people die in hospitals because of preventable errors. And of course, that initiated the whole movement today of patient quality and safety. In the 1980s, we were the first to point out that AIDS is now a true epidemic. It's not just affecting a small population of the nation, but broadly and globally. And that also created a great momentum, culminating, of course, in many AIDS programs, including PEPFAR, which, of course, is a huge program globally in treating and preventing AIDS. We're the first in the National Academies to say we should map the human genome. And even at that time, geneticists would say, you're crazy. This is too expensive. There's, not going to be enough. There's way too much information. But of course, today, as you know, we can sequence the human genome for less than $1,000. And the initiation, as you can see, of the whole idea of precision medicine. Our academies coined the term precision medicine, and of course now it's becoming a reality. We work globally on issues of global importance, including pandemics and others, and we also are the organization that in fact sets the U.S. dietary guidelines for U.S. government, for the nation. What are we doing recently? Well, under my presidency, we said there are three priorities. First, to respond to important critical challenges. Whether we're asked by Congress, by the White House, or actually asked by you. When, you, when I go around the country, around the world, listen to your concerns, we know that we need to address your concerns as serving all of you by taking on important issues, critical issues. Second is we advise the nation and the world on future health and health care. That is to say, if you look at this particular example, Vital Directions, we published 20 papers on the direction of health care for the new U.S. administration. As you know, this is now highly politicized, highly charged, but I've been spending a lot of time on the Hill and with U.S. administration to make sure that we move the direction in the health care in the right direction, despite all the argument about repeal and replace. We work with Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, a $10 million grant on creating culture of health. And of course, on the bottom, we believe as an institution we should lead and inspire, be bold, be audacious, inspire for the future. And of course, creating the uh, fellowship is one such expression of leadership for the future. But as you, I tell you a little bit about the grand challenge for healthy longevity, and also we are creating emerging leaders forum for the young people as our future leaders in healthcare. Let's talk about the first responding to the critical challenge, pandemic. 
So it was really shortly I arrived in Washington when I went to see my good friend, Jim Kim, who's the president of World Bank. Many of you may not know, he's a physician, and he used to be working for me in the, my department, so we became very good friends. And he said to me, you know, of course, working with Margaret Chan, this is Ebola outbreak. We need an independent organization to look at the problems of response, preparedness, and what's in the future. And of course, we as the independent organization would be best because there are reviews done by WHO, by the UN, but we need an outside group. For many years, we've actually looked at this issue of microbial threats to health and recognizing that this is a very important issue. We've been working in this space. And as many of you know, convergence is a perfect storm for the rapidly increasing pandemics and infectious outbreak. As a matter of fact, this is not going to slow down. If anything, we're going to have one up to four every single year of new outbreaks. Why? Because we are now urbanized. We live in crowded conditions. We have done deforestation and changed the environment. Yes, there is climate change. There is climate change. <laughs> and that, of course, is creating tremendous influence. And the closeness, if you will, of animal to human living, the transmission of many of the outbreaks today from actually animals, as you know, from avian, from bats, etc., to human, is one of the new phenomena which was explaining why there's so much in fact, infectious outbreaks. And of course, globalization, traveling from one place to the other. You know the story about SARS so well. So in our report, we said, look, what we need is a much stronger and better global regional governance and capabilities. We need a re-energized WHO, a dedicated center for health preparedness and response, coordinated by UN. By the way, Gabriel Leung from Hong Kong University is one of the members of this commission. And of course now, uh, Keiji Fukada, who's also arrived in Hong Kong University, work alongside with us on this. Second, of course, we need strengthening of public health and health capabilities everywhere in all these low and middle income countries. And of course, importantly, we need an accelerated program of research and development to get new vaccines, new treatment. So we put forth some very bold ideas, the need to invest in health, because it is a health security. When ministers of finance and leaders of government are worried about how much it is costing in health care, remember that in our analysis, led by Harvard researchers and uh, complemented by Larry Summers, that in fact, pandemics alone cost 60 billion US dollars per year over the last 10 years. So this is a major economic, if not a security threat. So we said that US should commit $4.5 billion a year, both to strengthen public health systems, uh, no, actually not US, but globally, but also to reinforce, to help WHO to strengthen its responsiveness, and of course to increase R&D. I'm happy to tell you, of course we're not the only report, we're one of the more important reports, but there are many others, but that many things have changed since then, the Ebola, although still not far enough, not fast enough. Indeed, WHO has created a new health emergency program. Uh, I was able to, to, um, to participate in the G7 preparation for Prime Minister Abe, and of course, they also, in the statement from G7, reinforced the importance of global health architecture and cited some of our work. The WHO now is, now is creating a contingency emergency fund, the World Bank for another emergency fund, and importantly, the creation of this coalition, of Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, a public-private partnership supported by government, foundations, NGOs, etc. Welcome Trust, Gates Foundation, Japan, India, many others. I'm on the board of this CEPI, which has raised $750 million in order to get preparedness for vaccine for the future. Tonight, with the Hong Kong Cambridge Medicine, we are actually launching this film by CNN Documentary. I invite you to come and see this. 
Uh, in fact, it's called unseen enemy. And emphasizes that the unseen enemy are the pathogens that we now face. And the Zika, and the Ebola, and the SARS, and the MERS. And what is, in fact, the condition, why we have this, and what we need to do in the future. And so I hope to see you there tonight. The second area I want to give you an example that's so important, again, responding to the needs of the society, is human genetics. This case, once again, it came from our scientists who said, you know, this technology called CRISPR-Cas9 is so effective and so easy to use. We now can manipulate genes so easily. What, what about the ethical society and regulatory framework of the usage of this? This slide shows you the ability to clip pieces of DNA precisely at where you want to be using a guide RNA and to replace whatever you want in terms of its place. So gene editing is now a very efficient way of doing things. And of course, the great concern is the, how would one use it in this area? Well, one area, of course, is think about the use in biomedicine. Somatic cells, the use of altering somatic cells to treat diseases. Already, hundreds of patients have undergone trials in which the T cells the CCL5 receptor is a receptor by which HIV virus enter the cells, that you can edit the cells out and, in fact, prevent the uh, infection or invasion of HIV into these cells. And so that, in fact, is an ongoing treatment. Imagine this is in the future of being able to greatly reduce at least the usage of triple drugs therapy, if not even curing the disease. Because you can imagine many other conditions, sickle cell anemia, genetic diseases. But perhaps the one that's really of great concern, of course, is using germline. Germline in terms of altering genes that cause disease, but germline in which it will change the subsequent generations forever. So while you can treat cystic fibrosis, and perhaps you can do that even in somatic cells or using iPS cells, the concern, of course, is what would it do if one were to use it to, to develop designer babies or gene enhancement? I can imagine it's a new way of looking at doping in, in the Olympics. So you, these raise a lot of issues of ethical and societal issues. And of course, also this technique, which can be used in agriculture, in insects, you name it, called gene drive, because of rapid short cycle of generations, quickly you can produce new species that can have major eco implications, sometimes good, because, for example, there's work done on mosquitoes which prevent them from carrying malaria, or Zika for that matter, to cause something that can be very bad. And we're also very concerned about bioterrorism. So for that reason, uh, the former president of the National Academy of Science, the late Ralph Cisron, and I decided we will take this on because we've always done that. Back in the days when recombinant DNA was coming in, we, the academies, took on the idea of how to self-regulate and also advise the government how to, in fact, create the right framework. So asking David Baltimore, the previous Nobel laureate, to chair our advisory group, work towards international summit that was done in collaboration with Chinese Academy of Science and Royal Society of the UK, and of course, ultimately, we put forward a very well thought out deep study called the report called Human Genome Editing, Science, Ethics, and Governance, in which we ask these questions, ethical legal standards, prospects of harmonization policy across the world, and overarching principle frameworks for using this technology. I ask you to, if you have a chance to read this report, it's very important. So this gives you an idea of what we do. In other words, when appropriate, we want to be helping and serving society by taking on this very critical, important subject. We also want to inspire people for the future. As we think about how can we actually make a huge difference in health and medicine, we think about ideas such as moonshot. You can go to the moon. Why can't we think about grand challenges in health and medicine? And after a couple of years of searching with distinguished committee members, we decided that actually aging 
is an important area. As you know, aging is now a big societal uh, issue. And we thought that by looking at aging, but not only living longer, but living healthier, how do we do that would be one way of addressing this. And last night, I had the fortune of meeting with a number of individuals to discuss this initiative. And let me just frame the issue. It's the highest risk factor of human disease. Why? Because come along with aging is degenerative processes, the aging process, which increases the chance of Alzheimer's, infirmities such as, such as hypertension, diabetes, osteoporosis, arthritis, you name it. But people are living longer than ever. And in fact, the number of baby boomers, what's called the silver tsunami, I guess I'm one of the tsunami, watch out. Uh, in fact, you know, I was told that in Hong Kong, your average age life expectancy is now 84, 85, one of the longest in the world. And in fact, if you look at trajectory going forward, by 2030, maybe 25% of your population could be over 65. This is a significant issue in terms of caring for those individuals, but also importantly, to make them more productive, effective, particularly, and we're looking at all these young people, but fertility in the world is going down. So if you look at the balance between ages, it's really important that we have healthy, older individuals alongside with healthy, young individuals to make this a vibrant society. So the question is no longer an issue of lifespan, but also health span. And so there's a lot of scientific work now done in the area, which I call almost inflection point. Exciting signs going on. How can we mobilize the signs and bring more of you to work in this area? The opportunity is enormous. So great insights to the biolog biologic basis of aging, advances of technology, digital technology, robotics, artificial intelligence. So for example, we now know some of the genes that in fact, certainly in animal models that uh, uh, is responsible for longevity and also health span. Certainly in sequencing and studying genes from oct octogenarians and people who live you know, a long time, we begin to un understand some of the genetic basis. But also, 70% of the aging process due to non-genetic basis, environment, behavior, socioeconomic. And of course, we now begin to understand epigenetics, that phenomenon that influenced genes, and now people are able to measure epigenetics and markers for prediction of biologic aging. Many breakthroughs in understanding molecular pathways, telomeres, uh, metformin, mitochondrial type therapies, and so many others. I'm simply pointing out to you that science is really moving fast. But it's not enough because we need to bring in other disciplines such as engineering and other technology. Besides under biology, the collection of information, we are measuring wearables, bowel sensors, information, big data that can help us predict who's likely to get disease when you're older and who's likely to be healthy and resilient. But also importantly, medical devices and of course, future technology. Technologies such as ways in which you can manage people at a distance, particularly for the elderly. Remote monitoring, internet of things in terms of helping elderly to be more productive, more functional. And of course, many others. I told last night, I always think about my late parents when they're in their really late stages of their life. They were really isolated. My mother, after my father passed, was isolated. She can't get around. We always have to get people to drive her. The idea of driverless cars, autonomous, robotics, so many things that we can do. So our idea is to launch an initiative to bring together people from all disciplines, not just medicine, but disciplines to work together as a way to really challenge and enable leapfrog and breakthrough ideas to help this area. As pointed out by some of my colleagues last night, it's a 
great thing to do for society because it will make the society more productive, happier, stronger. It's also an economic issue because imagine these technologies. They're all commercializable, create a whole industry. So the idea of a grand challenge is to get everybody stimulated. And how do we do this? We're thinking about creating an international commission to create a roadmap towards a healthy longevity, to create a strategy, to create a report like we did in Ebola and others for us to recommend countries from different places what to do. And we are talking about creating a grand challenge prize, a prize that will stimulate people to enter the area. And we're working on this so that, in fact, we can have breakthrough ideas from people not only in the health field, but imagine coming in from all different disciplines. As an important thing about the future, we of course think about the next generation. And when I look in this room, I can see that we are in good hands. But I think what we need to do is to provide you with the tools and also learn from you. And so we've been working at National Academy for a long time in the creation of fellowships, trainees, etc., and cultivating future leaders. Our fellows, we have the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Fellows, uh, Health Policy. We also have, as I mentioned, Emerging Leaders Forum, and of course, one locally for the District of Columbia in Washington, D.C. Our fellows are placed in White House, and you can see with Senator Nancy Pelosi, with others, and of course, here on the right side with the Secretary Sibelius and others. So they have experience working within the government under our tutelage as future leaders in health policies. And we have other types of fellowship, one of which now is called the International Fellowship, which is shaped after the second NAM Fellowship. We have an FDA Regulatory Fellowship with FDA and many others. And so the fellowship covers a large number of areas, biomedical science, health delivery, health policy, regulation, public health, health economics, bioethics, and law. And importantly, to me, this, as uh, President Sung says so eloquently, health and healthcare traverse borders. And as well become increasingly interconnected, ensuring good health for all will require global partnerships. Our next, our international fellowship will equip the next generation of global leaders with the experience and skills necessary to tackle current emerging challenges. And we so, feel so privileged to be partnering with you, CHK, in our first international fellowship. Here it is, the Center for Bioethics. Maybe, is it the same room? Not quite. But anyway, I can see this was launched with a great vision. And you know the mission of this, to explore and share knowledge about ethical challenges in the world of care, and congratulations, Derek, for leading this uh, center. And of course, we know that my good friend Edgar was a big driving force behind this. We at the Academy are also extremely interested in the area of bioethics. These are the divisions which, in fact, are focused on issues of bioethics, including one, the Committee of Science, Technology, and Law, uh, chaired by David Baltimore himself. And of course, over the years, we published many different reports on ethics. You've already seen one on human gene editing on the upper right-hand corner, but also mitochondrial uh, transfer therapy, and of course, reproductive cloning and many other issues. So this fellowship, I believe, is a unique one, which the individual, which is two-year for each fellow, it's, our agreement is over a three-year period, Hopefully that we'll be so successful we'll continue to do this, but we have one new fellow per year working two years. So any one time there'll be two fellows, a first year fellow and a second year fellow. These fellows will be in fact nominated by CUHK and then we'll select the final uh, fellow. And of course we'll spend two year period on this fellowship with 25% time in Washington with us and the rest of the time in Hong Kong. The idea, of course, is to pick projects which we are working in, in Washington and to bring it back to the context of Hong Kong to say, what does gene editing report mean? How are we going to work with the Hong Kong government and the scientific community to look at our framework? So it's a great win-win opportunity. 
and we're going to learn so much from you. So I think that it's entirely fitting that the first fellowship will emphasize bioethical issues because of visionary work by the Center of Bioethics here, and this fellowship will create the strong core of future pipeline of the faculty in, in fact, this Center for Ethics. I want to close by telling you how special this is to me. As you know, as Chinese, we don't really talk about our own background. And I actually, even as American, I have some difficult talking about myself. But let me just point out to you, I was born in China, and there's my family, and I have great respect for my parents, who in fact saw to it that picked up the family and came to Hong Kong. I was five at the time. You know the St. Joseph's up there, yeah. right? <laughs> Edgar, St. Joseph, yeah. right. So at age 18, for a variety of reasons, I went off to Canada to McGill. And after I finished my degrees, I went to the United States. And of course, Edgar, you recognize our hospital, New York Hospital. And of course, this is your current picture. You were much younger in those days. <laughs> but we formed a you know, friendship that bond us for a long time. My wife, Ruth, uh, you know, has great respect for Edgar admiration. I had the fortune of, after that year, went to Harvard and spent about 25 years there with a sixth year over at Stanford as the chief of cardiology and chair of medicine, returned to Harvard as his chair of medicine, and then was at Duke for the 10 years as chancellor and the CEO of the health system. And of course, I've been now at National Academy of Medicine. And you can see now I've got a wonderful family. Actually, this is a data picture because I've got three grandchildren. And uh, I put down also some of my areas that I've been very, very proud of. The creation of medical school in Singapore with National University of Singapore. In fact, I'm moving leaving tomorrow for the graduation of the seventh class, believe it or not. And of course, the creation, as you heard earlier, of the international NGO on innovations. But nothing's more meaningful than the 13 years I spent here, because it was those 13 years that really formative day, ages that taught me ethics, service, and integrity. So it's particularly meaningful to me that I have this opportunity to work with all of you in the sense of giving back to Hong Kong, but I'm sure I'm going to gain a lot also by working with all of you. So thank you so much. Thank you. Oh. Does anybody know who wrote this proverb? <laughs> you want one year of prosperity, grow grain. Ten years, grow trees. A hundred years, grow people. And that's why we have this fellowship. And tell me if you know who this person who wrote it. You know it? Okay. Thank you. The, the original, uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Zhao, uh, for the very stimulating lecture and the very lovely bio map uh, in the end. We all should have, have our bio map uh, at some time. Uh, the, the time doesn't allow us to move the stage and sit down and answer all the questions, but I, I hope uh, Dr. Zhao would uh, kindly entertain a couple of questions. Yes. Comments, questions? If, if I may uh, pose a, a question about the NAM uh, fellowship, the existing one in NAM, the idea is to get the middle early scholars. Uh, why is your thinking of getting the early scholars rather than really senior people like us to, <laughs> <laughs> to uh, work together in the NAM? For us, we have to work on healthy longevity. <laughs> No, I think that, as I think the proverb says so well, the last proverb, right? If you want to have you know, a whole generation of leaders, you need to get them involved very early. Mm. And I think that one of the problems with our academy is you get elected when you're successful. 
just like the prize. You get an award when you're successful. We want to get people into the field. We want to get people who are thinking about, I'm a doctor, but you know, why do I want to be involved with this stuff? But I know that if I look at leadership here, right, people who have actually had the background of medicine but leading a university, people who have actually, you know, leading a big business, it's really important that we get people to think about other areas and how it can bring your background to help. And of course, in policy and ethics is so important that we have people who have the right background. And so to me, the middle career is just about the right time yeah. when they're about to think about where they want to go and how to make their career's decision. This is the perfect timing to, for us to give them a little hand. Yeah. And with that, um, I'll close by just saying, uh, I'm sorry, sorry, Professor, so, sorry. Um, Victor, I'm very interested in your talk, especially uh, when you talk about um, doing all this research and coming up with a paper that may actually influence the policy maker uh, to make the world a better place, as you said. Uh, so if I may clarify a little bit, um, the National Academy of Medicine, uh, which is a US-based uh, institution, uh, will take the lead, and, and you have already uh, a couple of themes of, uh, of uh, studies. And now with this fellowship, you invite people to come to join you and bring it back to their own country or region. Uh, and hopefully, um, uh, I, I forgot what exactly the word you use, but sort of uh, regionalize it. Contextualize. Contextualize it, that's right. And, uh, and, and make it relevant to the place. So um, can, I, can I ask you uh, how, in, in, the, in the States, uh, perhaps uh, you, you, you have been very successful working on the senators and then influence, uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know about the current president, but perhaps the previous, <laughs> previous administration. I'll tell you over a drink. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, uh, are you expecting these fellows to also not just produce a paper, but somehow impact on uh, the local system? Of course, right. You know, um, first of all, the, uh, the process by which we do the research and to write a report, we've done that for, you know, a long, long time. It's actually a very rigorous process. Most of the reports take about a year to complete with uh, multiple open public hearings as well as private meetings. So we've conformed to the Federal Advisory Commission Act in which how we advise the federal government. But we also have some exemption that we can have private discussions but our report has to be gone through extensive review. So by the time we finish with this, the recommendations are formal recommendations. We've done that upon request from Congress, upon request from FDA, and we've done that in response to public issues. So one of the questions you're asking is, does the government listen to us, right? And that's because of 150 years of how our roots, we have an advantage. You mentioned in earlier comments that many countries come to us, and we certainly have many dignitaries, dignitaries that come to visit and say, how do we create an academy of the same nature where the government will come to us? I would say, in general speaking, it's a very good idea, and we have to work to get the credibility. So imagine that governments make policy. They certainly can make policy by looking at their own analysis. But these days, you know, trust is such an important issue. Independence and removed from politics. This is why our reports are so powerful in that regard, and they know it. So Congress will say, before we pass the bill, we should ask NAM or National Academies to do the analysis, etc. Second is that they should be coming to you, right? I mean, your government should say, CUHK, we have this issue, we have the expert. Can you give us some advice? I'm sure they do. But having a neutral organization which takes away the competition between universities is another very important issue. So perhaps the way to answer your question is that it takes some time. And I think your fellows, or our fellows, will have the opportunity to see how it works in our country and perhaps begin to seed a way of doing things over time. You know, you always need a critical mass. So if imagine the critical mass of people with that experience, and maybe some of them will actually work in the government. In fact, I can tell you many of our fellows uh, actually 
leaders in government. So it's easy enough to know, you know, how effective your organization is. And I think that's part of the idea. In the contextualization, what we hope to do is the following, because the fellow can spend two full years with us. We have a fellowship like that called NAM Fellowship. So what we do is we will probably mentor that person and select the project that's particularly interesting to a fellow that's already ongoing, because it takes a year to finish one anyway, and to, that's relevant in Hong Kong. That person can then join the project, learn from this, and then come back here and work in the current environment in the CHK, and then think about how do I actually take this information and develop a project in Hong Kong. Okay. And, we'll and, I, and we'll be very interested, in fact, if your fellows come and say, this really important issue in Hong Kong, would you be interested? That's how we did the Ebola, right? It's a multilateral opportunity. Sorry. Well, we certainly have to learn a few tricks from you how to influence our government. <laughs> uh, we're not doing, ECA maybe, but I'm not doing so well. On this. And, and a uh, final question, because, uh, sorry about the time. Yeah. Uh, well, the interest. well, actually, Victor, uh, some of my young fellows at the back want me to ask you this question before your lecture. It's somewhat personal. Yeah. You've got so many, so many things on your plate, and how do you prioritize yeah. and become so successful? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I, so first of all, I think people ask me about careers. I, I say that, you know, you can never plan your career. Think about the, my friends here. I mean, Edgar would have thought he was an oncologist, and look what he's doing now. <laughs> and, and in many ways, contributing in his own way just tremendously to society. So my advice to everyone is, love what you do, do the best, and you'll be recognized for doing a great job, and doors will open. Then it's up to you to say, I'm going to stay with this, or I'm going to follow this opportunity. And many of us, in fact, follow the opportunity with a passion for doing what we do and do well at it. And, and as far as choosing projects, etc., I say the other thing is have a great team of people around you because that, in fact, is how you can delegate and being able to move things in different ways. So you need an organizational uh, skill set. And I'm sure President Song learned that in his job as president as I learned my job at Duke how, you know, so many of my colleagues are now going to MBA. It's a good thing because they actually learn how to manage, et cetera. But that's another thing. Get good teams of people and prioritize. I, you know, when I was in uh, training and young men, people always tell me, focus, focus, focus. Because nobody knows who you are when you're in five different projects. And that's true. But at some point, because of this generation of the millennials and others who are multitaskers. It's hard to say this is the only thing I do, right? So my suggestion to you is, yes, you can do more than one, but make sure you have a priority and make sure you do a good job. When you're doing five things, you're not doing a good job, you're not helping anybody. When you're doing three things and you do a great job, that's when you can be successful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. By, by way of closing, I'll mention that the Center for Bioethics will is preparing for the uh, no, uh, process to invite applications for nomination to the NAM Fellowship. We'll do that sometime in the third or beginning of the fourth quarter. So watch out for the notice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Tang. Thank you very much, Dr. Joe and Dr. Ao. Can we please give Dr. Joe another big round of applause, please?